I've waited a long time to say this, but Dr. Peterson, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Glad to have you. Um, I thought we would just kind of cut straight to the heart of it. Um, I'd like to talk about the concept of fiat. And we hear a lot about fiat currency in the Bitcoin circles, but I think the original fiat, as I understand it, I'd love for you to correct me where I'm wrong, is this concept of fiat lux, when God said, let there be light, right? There's the original decree that started all things. Um, and it's my perception that all human acts of fiat are basically attempts of man to play God, right? We're trying to impose, someone speaking fiat to another is trying to impose his opinion on someone else. And it seems to be uh, an interruption to that dialogic process that engages us in truth discovery and meaning and whatnot. So, and we tweeted a little bit about this back and forth. I think I tweeted out, um, volition is the only sustainable binding to socioeconomic systems, which mm. that sounds complicated. Mm. Basically means we need to, all interactions need to be voluntary on both sides. Otherwise, optimally. Optimally, otherwise yeah. it breaks down. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good goal. Yeah, mm -hmm. and your response, you, you mentioned this, uh, as John Piaget demonstrated, mm -hmm. by the way, it's also why psychopathy is, to put it mildly, a suboptimal strategy. So I would love for you to expand upon that. I've barely read a little bit of Piaget, thanks to you. Um, but I'd love to hear your perspective on fiat and the necessity of mutual voluntary exchange in human relations. You know, Piaget did a lot of, so Jean Piaget is often uh, known as a developmental psychologist and developmental psychologists study the development of children. Um, he didn't term himself a developmental psychologist. He regarded himself as a genetic epistemologist. And um, epistemology is the study of systems of knowledge and perhaps an investigation into what makes a system of knowledge valid. Um, how do you know if, what does it mean for knowledge to be valid, let's say, and how do you know that it's valid? And how do you distinguish between a system of knowledge that's valid and one that's invalid? Um, and so that's epistemology, the study of knowledge structures. And genetic meant not genes, but beginning, as in Genesis. Now, Piaget, Piaget was actually interested in bridging the gap between science and religion, by the way. That was his fundamental motivation. Um, I'm, I'm just telling you that to put this all in a broader context. But he believed that philosophers would have had a better time trying to understand the structure of structures of knowledge if they looked at how they developed because they would develop from simple forms to more complex forms. And even if we couldn't necessarily understand the more complex forms, we might be able to understand the simpler forms and those would manifest themselves first in children. So that's Piaget's take on the world. And he was interested in a very wide range of topics, one of which was the development of morality in children. And that's where Piaget wrote a lot of books, and I haven't read them all. And God only knows how much, a lot of it isn't translated either. God only knows how much unmind wisdom there is in Piaget's lesser known books. But he believed that children played games because games were social microcosms. And so, and he believed that games by their very nature, for them to be games had to be voluntary. And that optimal games were optimally voluntary and simultaneously enjoyable and also devoted towards mutually shared ends. So for example, you could imagine two different kinds of play. One might be the kind of play you'd engage in in a formal game like baseball. And uh, another might be pretend play. And in baseball, you specify a goal and 
everyone who's playing accepts the same goal. People often think of games like baseball as competitive, and there's been some attempt among boneheaded educators to insist that the only valid games are cooperative games, but for someone as sophisticated as Piaget, that whole idea was a non-starter because people don't bring a basketball to a baseball game. And so what that means is that the mere act of agreeing upon the goal, which obviously you do in a game, was fundamentally cooperative, right? That's the landscape. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a, you could think about it as a constitutional agreement in some sense, right? What are we here for? Well, we're here to play ball. We're here to play baseball. Okay, well, we're not going to debate that. That's the cooperation. Well, now we can undertake the next goal, which would be perhaps the development of our athletic prowess or perhaps victory in this particular game. It's not so obvious exactly what the goal is, but there's different levels. And that that has to be played voluntarily. Right. And it's the same with games of, of pretend play. Um, children will sit down and negotiate their roles, their, their fragmentary identities for the purpose of right. the game. They'll act out the spirit of what they're mimicking, because Piaget was also extremely interested in imitation and, and wrote very, in a very sophisticated manner about imitation. And uh, we design roles and then we'll run the simulation voluntarily. And one of the points that Piaget made was that, well, a number of them, one was that there's something key to what we regard as morality itself in that process and experience of voluntary engagement. It's really profound, you know. So imagine when you're a child, you have a play partner, and you're having fun. Well, what does that mean exactly? What, what, I mean, those are the sorts of things we don't tend to think about because they seem so obvious that you pass by them without further notice. But why is one game fun and another game not fun? And, well, and then you might think, well, is, can there be a not fun game? And you think, well, yeah, but it's a pretty lousy game. It's not one I'd like to play. And Piaget's notion was, if it's a game that you wouldn't like to play, then it's ill-structured. It's immoral. He believed that the act of voluntary play in childhood was the precursor to the establishment of ethical societies. And that's a hell of an, an idea. It's an unbelievably profound idea, a remarkable idea. And he believed, furthermore, so not only that the game was a microcosm of society, and he meant that technically because it would be, imagine that as you become more sophisticated, as you move towards adulthood, your games become more sophisticated simultaneously, and at some point the game merges into adulthood. You say, well, adulthood's not a game. It's like, well, then you're not playing it properly. <laughs> well, I, I mean that. I, I really mean that. And, and it, it's, 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 again, almost impossible to overstate how profound an idea this is. Well, my marriage isn't a game. It's like, well, that means it's suboptimal. Because it should be, it should be voluntary, right? The, 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 the interactions that you have with your partner should be voluntary. And you should both want to do them and they should be self-maintaining as well. And if they're voluntary, they're much more likely to be self-maintaining because you don't have to maintain them by force. You right. don't have to expend right. energy. So, and I'll close with this. Sorry for the lengthy answer, but it's a comp <laughs> ask a complicated question, <laughs> get a complicated answer. Um, Piaget also believed that, imagine you had a game that was devoted to some end here and a game that was devoted, another game, that was devoted to the same end here. So two identical games, but here's the difference between the games. The players in one game are forced to play and the players in the other game have chosen to play. And Piaget's hypothesis was that over any reasonable amount of time, the game with voluntary players would outcompete the game with involuntary players because some of the game some of the energy in the game that could be devoted towards the game, let's say towards productivity, for example, would be wasted on it enforcement. Right. And it's wasted more than that because, you know, if you have to force, well, then you also don't have positive emotion working for you. Uh, you know, genuine, the genuine enthusiasm that comes with voluntary engagement. And so here, 
an optimally structured social institution, even if that's just one person and another, say in the course of a marriage, if it's optimal, it has a game-like nature. And it's voluntary, it's based on voluntary association, and it maintains itself without external compulsion, and it has that playful spirit if it's done properly. And that's a good principle for analyzing your relationship with yourself, your relationship with the topics that you consider, your relationship with your family members, uh, your relationship with your friends, and also the structure of, of broader social structures. To the degree they deviate from desirable voluntary game, they deviate from ethical optimality. Mm. And that's all tangled up in Piaget. And much more as well, but that's a good start. And that's a great start. Yeah, it's something. <laughs> man.